Hi, Nouriel. Thank you for giving me this interview. Such a pleasure, Sandra. Thank you. Nouriel, you have said that crypto crazies are waging cyber terrorism and that they have made death threats against you because of your vociferous criticism. What happened and why are people in the crypto business so militant? Well, uh, these are really cyber fanatics. On one side, they have absolutely no uh, economic and financial literacy. Uh, they don't know about money, about banking, about monetary policy, about central banks. And they want to radically change the world. And their ideology and their books written about it is uh, very much of a right wing, uh, almost like white supremacist. You know, governments are evil. Corporations are evil, uh, banks and bankers are evil, and therefore there is a bit of a anarchic but right-wing uh, streak to them. So um, anybody who is challenging them, uh, they become uh, aggressive, and since they are hackers, you know, they send you threatening messages, they try to hack my emails, they try to hack my, uh, you know, social media. So they become really nasty. And there are also armies of uh, trolls uh, online that essentially bombard anybody who is criticizing them. So, so they're, they're a bit uh, zealots. They're really like religious fanatics, and like religious fanatics, they tend to be uh, quite intolerant. That sounds very intimidating. Why do you still go on voicing your opinion and raising awareness? Well, I think it's important for uh, several reasons. One is that, as I've pointed out, there is a huge amount of really uh, criminal activity in this space. Uh, scammers, uh, uh, tax evaders, money launderers, uh, people who are trying to rip off uh, retail uh, suckers, the way they call them. And, uh, and I'm worried about uh, uh, any bubble in which suddenly there is FOMO like it happened uh, at the end of 17, where everybody's talking about crypto, prices were rising, and lots of people put a lot of their money and their investment, and then uh, Bitcoin fell from 20,000 to 3,000, uh, and lots of people lost their shirt. Uh, there's even evidence that uh, students in the US use their student loans to buy crypto, and then again, they had massive losses. So I think uh, there's a little bit of a public policy uh, element to it. Uh, you know, one, uh, when I see a bubble, I'm an expert of bubbles, I can call one. Two, there is even a good uh, public service involved because warning uh, uh, investors that are otherwise uh, clueless about the risk of crypto and of the losses you can make out of all these uh, scams and criminal activity, I think uh, provides a public service to people that are otherwise uh, a little bit naive. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think what you call shit coins, why do you call them that? Or maybe you just gave the explanation. But do you think that they actually are a currency? Because a prominent central banker told me I should call them crypto assets, not actually cryptocurrencies. Well, uh, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, the term um, cryptocurrency, it's a misnomer on many dimensions because anybody who knows uh, history and theory of money and currency knows that for something to be a currency has to be first um, a unit of account. Uh, good services have to be priced in it. Secondly, you know, has to be a single numerator so that you can compare the price of one good uh, to the price of another good uh, in the same currency. Three, it has to be a scalable a means of payment so you can use it to do lots of transactions and buying goods and services and four it has to be also a, a stable uh, so a store of value against both uh, buying goods and also as a store of wealth now if you look at um, any one of these cryptocurrencies even the one that is more prominent bitcoin let alone to those thousands of what i've called uh, shit coins and i call them shit coins because uh, 85 percent of all uh, uh, icos these initial coin offerings a study showed were scams and the rest of it uh, they're mostly failed very few of them have survived so in that sense uh, they are junk but even if you look at the bitcoin or some of the other major prominent unquote cryptocurrencies they're not currencies one they're not unit of account. Nobody 
nobody is pricing any goods in Bitcoin. Uh, literally, there's no good or service price in Bitcoin uh, or let alone Ethereum. Uh, secondly, uh, if you have a world in which everything is unquote tokenized because every coin is a different token, uh, you don't have a single numerator to uh, measure the relative price of two goods. If I have to buy Coca-Cola with a Coca coin, and if I have to buy Pepsi Cola with a Pepsi coin, and I have to buy another good with an X coin, uh, how can I tell the relative price of a Coca Cola and, and a Pepsi? It's impossible because everything is a different token. This is if uh, in the US we're using yen, euro, dollar, Swiss franc, pound, and so on, and for different goods, uh, different currencies. It's just chaos. It's literally like going back to barter. Uh, if you think about it, having all these seven tokens, you know, even the Flintstones had a had a single numerator. They were using some, uh, you know, shells, but they had a single numerator. <laughs> so they had a more advanced uh, financial system than than these guys who want to go back effectively to tokenization, this barter. Three, uh, you know, these things are not scalable. Even Bitcoin, you can do barely five transactions per second. If you use the Visa network, you can do 25,000 transactions per second. And I'm not going to go into the technicalities, but uh, these things uh, cannot be scaled. And the only way to scale them is to make them centralized. And the whole point is they're supposed to be decentralized. And four, uh, they're not stable store of value against wealth or buying goods uh, because, you know, the price of Bitcoin can go up uh, 10, 20 percent one day. And it can go down uh, 10, 20 percent the other day. That's why e even uh, crypto conferences don't accept uh, Bitcoin to pay for the conference fee. You have to pay in dollars and no merchant want to accept Bitcoin for payment because suppose that you accept Bitcoin and you have a profit margin of 10 percent and then overnight uh, the value of Bitcoin falls 15 percent. Uh, you have wiped out uh, your entire profit margin and made a loss. So, you know, for things to be currencies have to be stable, store of value, and they're not. So, so they're definitely, they're definitely not a currency. That's a total misnomer. And yeah, people now sort of call them, you know, crypto assets. But first of all, they were created under the pretense that it will be currencies used for transactions. And uh, these are assets that are not uh, backed by anything, uh, you know, uh, real assets give you a, a flow of income, you know, real estate gives you rent or housing services, stocks give you dividends, uh, bonds give you a coupon. Uh, what, what, what's the underlying uh, uh, intrinsic value of these assets? An asset has to have something that is either useful tra for transactions or as a stream of income generating it. Um, and these things don't have either one. So, so even calling them assets, um, it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, they're junk assets, so they're worth nothing. Hmm. Despite, That's why they're shit coins. <laughs> Despite all that, they seem to hit a nerve and people flock to them because they feel that central banks stealthily expropriate them. And so they say at least they feel somewhat in control of cryptocurrencies, which obviously is deceiving. But do you think there'll be more demand? Deutsche Bank just did a study and sees increasing demand in crypto assets. No, I don't think so. You know, there is this rhetoric that, you know, that fiat currencies are being debased by central bank. But the reality is that if you're looking at uh, all advanced economies, inflation is low they cannot even achieve a two percent uh, target in most emerging markets with the exception of uh, venezuela here or zimbabwe there inflation is very low and therefore this argument that you know fiat currency is being debased by printing money and eroding the real value uh is is not correct and uh, and with crypto you can lose 20 or 30 percent of your value in a matter of days. I mean, let's not forget from the peak, even with the rally that uh, some of these uh, cryptocurrency has had in the last year, from the peak, uh, uh, Bitcoin is down 65%. Uh, the other top 10, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and others are down from the peak uh, 80%. And uh, all the other 
thousands of shit coins that were scammed in the first place, you know, are done uh, 99%. So, you know, in terms of erosion of the real value of the assets, in a matter of 12 months, uh, uh, you have been wiped out of uh, whatever value was, uh, you know, to a power of 10 compared to any any fiat currency. So, so the idea that, you know, that fiat currencies are dangerous, they are risky, is not based uh, on any data. And if there is something is dangerous and risky and has been debased, uh, has been uh, these uh, pseudo uh, cryptocurrencies that are, that are shit coins. So I don't, I don't understand that particular kind of criticism. And there is no wide adoption. I mean, really, when, of course, the price of Bitcoin in 2017 was going from 5, 10, 15, 20, and it was a bubble, of course, people had FOMO. Uh, fear of missing out and they were just buying it because of speculative demand but uh since the price of bitcoin has collapsed now uh, transactions have collapsed by 80 percent usage has collapsed by 90 percent and uh, nobody's using it the only people are using it is not for transaction they're doing speculative transaction and there is uh, a lot of actually activity that has a uh, uh, elements of price manipulation and front running and wash trading and fake trades. You know, people have shown that uh, in academic studies that up to 90% of uh, unquote uh, trades in these exchanges are fake. They have to pretend there is trading so there is volume and people are using it, but uh, even that one is fake. So, so where is the demand? Who is using it and for what? Uh, the adoption has collapsed. It's completely collapsed. There was a fad, there was a bubble, went bust, and now you know they are they are a minor, you know, unquote asset class uh, that, depending on on the day, might be worth 100 to 150 billion uh, compared to financial wealth around the world of 80 trillion. So it's nothing. It's 0.0001 percent of financial wealth, and the value of most of this stuff uh, asymptotically is worth even zero, not even that 100 billion market cap it has right now. Christine Lagarde just said that the ECB is exploring the feasibility of stable coins because they want to get ahead of developments. Should central banks embrace cryptocurrencies? Well, again, you know, a number of central banks are now starting to think about creating, uh, you know, their own... Um, potentially central bank digital currencies. But uh, let's be clear, if and when those digital currencies were to be created, they would have nothing to do with crypto. They would have nothing to do with blockchain. What is happening today is, of course, is that only commercial banks have access to the balance sheet of the central banks, and that's how the interbank payment system works. Now, what does it mean to create a central bank uh, digital currency? It means that gradually, less and less people are using uh, cash. And eventually, uh, in some societies like Sweden or like uh, China, uh, almost nobody is using cash. So there is already uh, a bunch of uh, a private uh, digital payment system. Uh, they have nothing to do again with uh, blockchain or crypto. Say in China, is Alipay and WeChat Pay. They're not crypto based, they're just digital payment system. And even our bank deposits are digital payment system, if you think about it. Now, if uh, a central bank would allow now, not only commercial banks, but every individual, every household and every corporation to have a bank account with the central bank, then uh, we would not need to use uh, uh, deposits in the banking system or wire transfers or checks or other types of uh, private digital payment system to do transactions because you know a centralized uh, uh, central bank digital currency will be uh, very efficient uh, fast uh, zero cost or near zero cost and safe uh, and therefore uh, if and when central banks were to create a central bank digital currency uh, it's not going to be based on crypto it's not going to be based on blockchain is not going to be decentralized. It's not going to be based on some uh, decentralized, the permissionless, uh, trustless authentication algorithm. It will be based on the central bank in a centralized way, uh, like today, 
making sure that everybody's account is safe. So it'll be a fully centralized system and it will dominate uh, not just crypto, because at that point, who wants crypto is risky and dangerous, but will also dominate maybe some of the private uh, payment systems like the Alipays or WeChat Pays or the Venmos or the PayPals. And it will probably dominate also, uh, you know, the uh, commercial banks uh, deposit payment system. So, so central banks are cautious about thinking about that because you might disintermediate uh, payment system that already existing, uh, highly scalable in the private sector. That's why there are some pros to those ideas, but there are also uh, some, some risks because you have to change the nature of the fractional reserve uh, banking system where banks essentially do a maturity transformation of short-term deposit into long-term lending uh, to the private sector. Uh, that's why central banks are going to go cautiously in disintermediating uh, private, private banks. And that's why they are worried about the consequences of central bank digital currency. But uh, people in crypto get excited every time a central bank says we're considering a central bank digital currency as, of, as if that was based on blockchain or crypto. And it's not true. It will be a totally centralized, permissioned uh, system that has nothing to do with, uh, with blockchain. Are central banks worried about systemic risk, potentially? Well, currently, uh, they're not worried about the systemic risks uh, of crypto because it's such a tiny asset class, you know, worth 100 to 150 billion dollars that even if uh, it was wiped out over time, uh, some fools that put their savings there are going to lose their, their money and their shirts, but uh, you would not have any uh, systemic effect. What they are getting uh, concern is that if if uh, projects like uh, Libra, for example, or in the case of China, uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay that are the way most people are doing their payments, if these are very large, uh, there may be uh, systemic uh, consequences. And I'll give you the following example. Uh, you know, uh, in this uh, digital payment system, uh, you know, the system essentially keeps your balances. It's what's the, called the float. And they make money because they pay zero interest rate on your balances, but they can invest it into, unquote, safe assets. And the difference between what they get as a return on the safe asset and zero pay to you is the float on which they make profits. That's how they make money, right? Now, suppose that uh, these uh, large payment system like Alipay and WeChat Pay were to invest into something risky, like, you know, instruments that might be defaulting. And we had experiences during the global financial crisis where even money market fund went bust and then there was a run and a panic. Then, uh, then there could be a run and a panic that could be you know, destabilizing the financial system. And that's why the Central Bank of China, the PBOC, now is told uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay that uh, you cannot decide to invest uh, your uh, float balances in what you want, but you have to instead put all that money into a zero interest rate balance safe with the Central Bank to avoid a situation in which uh, there could be a run in, uh, in case uh, uh, some people worry that these uh, things are too large and they are investing into something risky. So some of the concerns about uh, systemic risk, and that was in China, Alipay and WeChat Pay, but in the US and around the world, uh, if, and it's a big if, Libra were to become a payment system, is to make sure that uh, it doesn't cause that type of a systemic risk. That is a, a run uh, against uh, those payment systems if they do investments that are highly risky. So, so eventually, there will be concern about uh, the systemic risk of uh, so-called uh, stable uh, coins, but we're not yet there. What's your take on Facebook's Libra? Well, my, my, my take on it is that, uh, you know, no central bank or regulator is going to allow it because uh, one of the key things, by the way, in the financial system is this anti money laundering rules and uh, KYC, uh, know your customer rules, because there is a lot of activities that are shady, that are criminal, there is trafficking, that is money laundering, that is terrorist financing, 
and so on and so on. And therefore, the international financial system, when you do transactions uh, both within countries and uh, more importantly, cross-border, uh, there's a whole system that the banks have to know their customer and to make sure that uh, the transfers are not done for MAL and the you know, money laundering kind of activities. Now, in the case of uh, Facebook, you know, Facebook, anybody can create an account and they can have a fake name and fake name, fake identity, whatever not. So suppose there's a Libra and I have a fake account and I'm a criminal or a money launderer, tax evader, and I can freely transfer my Libra account uh, from uh, US to Thailand or an offshore financial center and uh, Facebook doesn't know who I am then that's something that no central bank, no regulator around the world uh, can find it acceptable. And if you then, as a Facebook, want, you want to have Libra, you have to have all the proper MAL and KYC uh, compliance, and that's costly. You have to verify the identity of all these people. That's why there are compliance costs that create some frictions and transaction costs uh, in traditionally regulated uh, financial institutions. Uh, so. So you cannot essentially be a provider of liquidity and transfer money within country and across countries freely uh, without uh, doing the proper MAL and KYC. Uh, no, no, no central bank will accept it. That, that's why uh, even uh, Steve Mnuchin, who is the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury and is not uh, a left-wing Bolshevik, he said that one day, we cannot allow crypto uh, or any other of these systems to become the next uh, Swiss bank account where people are hiding money and avoiding all our activities to make sure there is no uh, criminal movement of financial uh, transactions. So, so this is one of the examples of how uh, Libra uh, is not going to fly. You know, if you want to be there and provide those uh, payment services, then you're a bank. Then you have to register as a bank. You have to subject all to all regulation and supervision and capital requirement and liquidity requirement, know your customer, anti-money laundering, uh, financial stability, and so on. But then you have to be a bank, and as a bank, you'll have the bank's uh, cost, uh, all the cost of compliance, and therefore you don't have an advantage. And nobody's going to allow you instead to be a free bank who can do anything without any any concerns about these fundamental issues of stability and safety of the financial system. Uh, so in my view, uh, either they become a bank and they'll be competing like everybody else with all the same regulation and costs, or they will never be allowed to fly. Nobody's going to allow Libra to fly anywhere uh, in the current setup. It's, it's not going to happen and nobody's going to accept it. But considering that crypto lives in cyberspace, can it even be effectively regulated and policed? Oh, yeah, no, it can be. You know, actually, some of the law enforcement activities and agencies prefer actually illegal transaction occurring, uh, you know, in, uh, in Bitcoin and crypto because, you know, uh, it's all on a public ledger. So, you know, where every transaction is uh, on a public ledger, you, of course, may not know the identity of the private key of the particular agent individual is moving the money, but they're smart enough that once they see large amounts of transactions that look like uh, uh, fishy, then they can go and figure out uh, uh, what's the private key and who is behind it. So actually compared to the current system where, you know, around the world there are shell companies and there are offshore financial centers and people move around money to shady financial institutions, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement authorities prefer crypto, and that's why they were able to break lots of, uh, you know, criminal cells. You know, there's this view that crypto is anonymous, uh, but there is nothing anonymous about crypto. And again, if uh, crypto has to become legitimate, then if you are uh, trading on that exchange, uh, you have to, uh, how to say, it, you have to report to the relevant tax authority uh, your crypto assets, your capital gains, your income, because again, no, no financial or tax authority is going to allow anybody earn income and evade taxes. So either everything is registered and you have to declare your assets and what you do, or otherwise they're not going to allow these things to happen 
And there are plenty of ways in which they can crack down and go even against their anonymity. Uh, you know, that's why in crypto, there is a talk about decentralization, but 99% uh, of all transactions in crypto occur on uh, centralized exchanges. And those centralized exchanges can be regulated like any other financial institution. So this idea of uh, free, free anonymity is just um, nonsense. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. Speaking of centralized ledgers, JP Morgan, KPMG and other institutions all launched blockchain platforms. Do you think that blockchain technology has the potential to disrupt the financial industry and the financial system? Well, you know, I've been writing a lot even about the blockchain and arguing that uh, blockchain is probably the most hyper overhyped uh, new technology uh, ever and is, in my view, no better than a distributed, uh, you know, database or spreadsheet. Because uh, now that crypto is failing, everybody says, you know, a blockchain is going to resolve lots of problems. And they're talking about enterprise uh, blockchain or corporate blockchain or enterprise DLT, where DLT stands for distributed ledger technology. But if you think about it, all these experiments, and they're all experiments without any success, uh, they have nothing to do with what blockchain is about because blockchain is supposed to be public while all of these systems uh, developed by various banks or IBMs or KPMG of the world, they're not, uh, they're not public ledgers, they're private. Two, blockchain is supposed to be uh, permissionless where an algorithm and uh, thousands of people authenticate transactions and instead is a system that is... Uh, uh, not permissionless, but permission, where a few people have the authority to permission uh, an authenticate transaction. It's supposed to be decentralized, uh, while all these systems are, again, centralized, and it's supposed to be based on a trustless system of verification of, uh, of transaction, while all of these things happen through a number of trusted uh, authorities that can authenticate. So they call it... Uh, uh, blockchain, but is uh, private, is centralized, is permissioned, is based on trusted authorities. So it's like a distributed permissioned, uh, you know, database uh, or sets of documents. You know, Google Doc uh, is a distributed, uh, you know, uh, sets of uh, permissioned uh, databases, right? A few people that are my a group can be permission to change these uh, Google documents and I decide who is going to be part of this club who is not. And nobody calls Google Docs uh, blockchain or crypto. So we already have distributed databases have nothing to do with blockchain. And what people talk uh, when they talk about, uh, you know, enterprise blockchain is just a bunch of private uh, distributed databases. It's nothing to do with blockchain. Blockchain is a sexy term and they use it, but it's not truly really you know, blockchain first. Secondly, all these financial institutions have spent billions of dollars doing uh, blockchain experiments. They've even patented lots of stuff. And recently the CEOs of Bank of America, of Wells Fargo, of MasterCard, they've said, you know, we have experimented, we spent billions of dollars, we've even patented, and we have not yet found a single problem it can be resolved uh, in a way that is more cheap and efficient with blockchain than with uh, traditional technologies. And uh, so there is no application that this actually uh, works. Uh, there was a study even of uh, using blockchain in uh, what is called the social impact. People say, let's uh, bank the unbanked, provide financial services to the poor, provide identity to refugees and migrants. And there's been a study showing 43 experiments with blockchain for social stuff and out of these 43 experiments zero zero have been successful zero so it's a totally overhyped technology nobody even understand it and so far has not resolved uh, you know any problem and just you know it's a it's a technology uh, in charge uh, in search of finding a question to which uh, it can provide a solution, but there is no question and no answer to 
that this technology so far has been able to provide. So to me, it's just a, another fad uh, without any real promise. Fascinating. Is there anything else we should consider when thinking about crypto? Um, well, you know, uh, as I pointed out, you know, in my view, um, the great uh, misnomer about crypto is that it's a system claimed to be decentralized, but it's not decentralized. You know, if you look at the miners, there are uh, half a dozen miners who are controlling all of the mining of Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies. So it's a centralized system, it's not a decentralized. Uh, you have centralization of transactions because the transaction, 99% of them occur on a centralized exchange, rather the decentralized is a centralized system where the developers are essentially controlling the code and then when the code doesn't work, uh, they change the code. Uh, and there've been all these forks of one cryptocurrency into another one. So it's not decentralized, it's a centralized system. You know, Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum is called the benevolent dictator of Ethereum. So it's a centralized system even of coding of development where the coders are police, prosecutor and judge. And, uh, and there is also massive uh, centralization of, of wealth. You know, the Gini coefficient is the measure of how unequal the distribution of income and wealth is. Uh, if the coefficient is zero, uh, it means that you have a flat distribution, everybody's equal. If it's one, all the wealth and income is in one individual. Now, uh, the coefficient Gini in Europe is around 0 0.3. In US is 0 0.5, we're a more unequal society. In North Korea, when Kim Hong Jun and his family you know, owns everything. The coefficient is 0 0.83, very unequal society. Guess what? Study was made of Bitcoin. Uh, the Gini coefficient of Bitcoin is 0.86%. So it's a more unequal system of wealth than even North Korea. So, so much for being decentralized and providing freedom and economic opportunity and wealth uh, to the poor. It's just a bunch of uh, whales who are controlling it all, and it's a big scam. So decentralization is a, is a nice uh, catchy thing, but is is as centralized as anything. Well, Nouriel, thank you so much for sharing your enlightening insights with us and for your courage in speaking out and educating us. Uh, always a pleasure to speak about important topics and. Great uh, to have had uh, this conversation with you uh, today, Sandra. Thank you, Noriel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.